Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. Coming up in the news this week, still another use for Oxford's Gillespie Street property and our increased village taxes and township taxes in our future. Stay tuned and learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. An Oxford boy was injured after an ambush at Bayshore Park. The young man was struck in the head with a rock when he and his friends had an altercation with another group of boys while walking through the park. The Oakland County Sheriff's Department was called and the boy was taken to the hospital. At the request of the department, a set of medical results were sent to the Oxford Sheriff's substation and the investigation continues. The search is on for an Oxford man for an alleged domestic assault on his girlfriend at their Cottage Street home. The woman suffered a bloody nose after an argument escalated into a physical altercation. Before the police arrived, the man fled the home and could not be located. But for her safety and her well-being, officers drove the woman to her sister's home. The search is still on for the man. An Oxford man called Oxford Village Police to his East Burke Street apartment after his ex-girlfriend had broken into his home. The man told police that the woman started beating on him and breaking personal items. The woman was still at the home when officers arrived and they were eventually able to calm the situation. There may be another use for the village-owned property at 98 Gillespie Street. The Oakland Livingston Human Service Agency is exploring the possibility of construction of apartments for senior citizens ages 55 or older who are deaf, hard of hearing, or have vision problems and or. There are four or five projects like this across the country, but this would be the first for Michigan. If approved, there would be 40 to 50 small apartments on the site. Each apartment would include technology and amenities designed for assisting residents and enhancing their quality of life and personal safety. Although there are, is strong interest, it should be noted there is, as of this date, no serious commitment. It looks like Oxford Township voters may face a request for higher po uh, police tax. Oxford Township trustees voted to draft a request for a 3.9152 tax levy, and if approved, the township voters, the uh, new tax would start December 2015 and end December 2019. Voters can weigh in with their vote on November 2014. Currently staffed with 15 officers, the Sheriff's Office has patrolled the Oxford Township since 2000. The millage addresses the department's current needs as well as future patrol officer requirements. The tax will uh, affect township residents only because the uh, village of Oxford has its own police force. It looks as though the Oxford Village Council is still struggling with the decision to leave the 911 dispatch issue to public vote. The other choice is for council to make a determination without resident input. In addition, there appears to be difficulty by Village Legal and the council to determine how the ballot would be proposed to the public. To observe the complex nature of the issue, you can view the May 6th Village Council meeting by going to our website, occtv.org. Then click on the programs and watch the most recent Village meeting. In short, the, quest, the question is, should Oxford residents continue funding the Village 911 Dispatch Service budgeted for over $300,000 per year, or should Oakland County be contracted at an estimated cost of $28,000? The majority of council appears to be keeping things status quo and have talked about raising taxes instead. Current Oxford Township, Lake Orion Township, and Addison Township contracts with Oakland County. Well, Terry, did you hear what went on with the um, Oxford High School uh, prom this year? I heard just a little bit about it and it doesn't sound good. No, they had a breathalyzer test checking out the kids as they went into the prom. And guess what? They found 14 students had alcohol and they called the local police it was in Troy and immediately after that the parents oh boy I don't envy those parents and I don't envy the kids they everybody wants to celebrate and this has gone on since 
the Stone Age that Moses. people want to <laughs> celebrate their year end and have a really um, good time at their prom. Uh, but, you know, it's about time we all as a community acknowledged it. Mm. So I'm really glad that the school was on top of things like mm. that. We need to take our head out of the sand and acknowledge that there is problems like that around here, with, with, in all, as in all schools. But it takes a village to raise a child, and so we all need to take responsibility for this. But again, <laughs> I don't envy those kids or their parents. And we want to keep these kids safe. That's, that's right. the whole that, purpose yeah, behind it. Yeah, it could have been a disastrous evening, and it wasn't. And that's it for news this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories and others, go to your local store and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. Coming up next on OCTV, more news. Watch our local Oxford sports with Andy Curtis. Oxford School News with John Ochins and Dave Kenny with his automotive talk show and Science in the News programs. That's it for Oxford News this week. I'm Terry Stiles. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, General Motors is planning to launch a new belt assurance system which does not allow the vehicle to shift out of park until the driver and front passenger are buckled in on selected vehicles later this year. This safety initiative comes in the wake of GM's expanding recall crisis which has reached 29 recalls covering 13.6 million vehicles in the United States. The company is under multiple internal and external investigations and has agreed to a $35 million fine from federal regulators for failing to report safety defects in a timely fashion. Gen GM's uh, spokeswoman Jennifer Eccleston said the new belt assurance system will be offered as an optional feature in select 2015 models including the GMC Sierra and Chevrolet Cruze, Colorado and Silverado. GM does not plan to charge extra for this feature. To apply the new system to seat belts, it detects front pa seat passengers and communicates with the brakes and transmission to prevent the driver from shifting the vehicle into gear before both passengers are buckled up. And at Chrysler, the 2015 Dodge Challenger SRT is Chrysler Group's first use of a new 6.2 liter supercharged V8 engine created at more than 600 horsepower to take on the Ford Mustang GT500 and Camaro ZL1. The motor, known as the Hellcat, is expected to rival that of the 640 horsepower 8.4 liter naturally aspirated V10 that powers the automaker's halo car, the 2014 SRT Viper. According to the automaker's five-year business plan, the supercharged Hellcat is expected to migrate to other SRT vehicles, including the Charger SRT. The Challenger SRT goes on sale later this year, but pricing was not announced, and you can expect it might cost a couple of pennies more. And at Volkswagen, Volkswagen plans a lineup of Beetle-themed vehicles, including a new version of the iconic microbus, according to European press reports. When VW renews the Beetle in 2019, it also will debut a crossover coupe and a mini multi-purpose vehicle, all based on the MQB architecture that underpins vehicles, including the new Golf, the reports say. VW has shown microbus concepts over the years, but hasn't pulled the trigger on a production model. The latest was the electric Bully concept at the 2011 Geneva Auto Show. And in Japan, Japan automakers are aiming to take the lead in fuel-efficient powertrains and they've joined forces in a new consortium to develop the next generation of fuel-sipping combustion engines. Their goal? A 30% improvement in the fuel efficiency of traditional gasoline and diesel engines by 2020. The Japanese government will aid the, com com <coughs> the country's eight automakers by chipping in half of the project's $9.9 .9 million budget. The automakers will foot the rest. The R&D push is being organized under the newly created Research Association of Automotive Internal Combustion Engines. It pulls the resources of Toyota, Nissan, Honda, Mazda, Mitsubishi, Daihatsu, Suzuki, and Fuji Heavy Industries, which is, makes the Subaru brand vehicles. The R&D will eventually feed into production vehicles. The strategy is patterned after a similar approach taken by competitors in Europe, organizers say. The 
Rivals cooperate with academia and government on basic technologies giving European car makers a head start in cutting cost. Something we should try here. And the bleed keeps on at GM. General Motors is now recalling 2.4 million U.S. cars, trucks, and SUVs in four separate safety recalls, raising its recall to it for the year to more than 13.6 million vehicles. The recalls included 1.3 million Buick, Enclave, Chevrolet, Traverse, and GMC Acadia large crossovers from model years 2009 to 2014 and 2009 to 2010 Saturn Outlooks because front seat belt cables can wear out over time and separate increasing injury risk in a crash. Also, 1.1 million, million, uh, million Chevrolet Malibus from 2004 to 2008 and Pontiac G6 sedans from 2005 to 2008 because of a shift cable in the four-speed automatic transmission that can wear out resulting in mismatches of the gear position indicated by the shift lever. And 1402 Cadillac Escalade and Escalade SEV models from 2015, which went on sale last month because of a problem with the passenger side airbag that could result in partial deployment in a crash. And lastly, 58 Chevrolet Silverado HD and GMC Sierra HD full-size pickups from the 2015 model year for a fire risk. GM said the retention clips attaching the truck's generator fuse blocks to the vehicle body can come loose and potentially lead to a fire. Boy, I hope all that stuff stops soon. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. Come on out for Friday night fish at the Oxford American Legion Hall. It's delicious. We love the Legion. They have great fish and good family fun. American Legion fish fry. It's awesome. And the drinks are good. The food is good. The service is awesome. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today, I'm just an aluminum can, but one day, I could be a stadium. I'm John Ochins and welcome to the Oxford Wildcats School Update. Last week we reported that Oxford Middle School received the 2014 Education Excellence Award from the Michigan Association of School Boards for their pre-engineering program. We had a chance to visit the school this week and speak with Principal Ken Weaver about the honor. We were honored by the MASB, which I think is the Michigan Association of School Boards. Uh, we won an Education Excellence Award for this year um, for our efforts in the pre-engineering program. Uh, we have put in place um, a program called Project Lead the Way, which is out of uh, the state of Indiana. Um, and it's a really hands-on, um, rigorous curriculum that uh, challenges students to think outside the box, to problem solve, um, to to that higher level critical thinking skills that are so they're developed um, and we're really excited about it and we offered we're unique in the fact that we offer it to all of our students um, we don't save this program just for the gifted or the top 10 percent 10 percent or 15 percent we put every child through this program um, and they get to work on such uh, software as computer-aided design software um, stuff that would be industry grade level software um, and they design different projects and then in eighth grade they get to to make them and, and so forth and it really is a, a, a fun program a challenging program um, I know my son uh, who's in sixth grade absolutely loves the class and had a great time with it this year well, well I designed software in the sixth grade didn't you 
<laughs> no, I, <laughs> I remember in sixth grade, I don't even, well, computers were around, but we certainly didn't have them in school. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. until I was about a junior senior in school. <laughs> this isn't the first time that Oxford has been honored by this group, is it? Um, no, I, we have won several uh, of these awards. Um, I mean you as in a class in your school? In, in the Oxford Middle School, this is our second one. Oh. The district has won several. Um, they were just honored last year. They have many different categories. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we won this year for the, the pre-engineering program. Um, and we had also won about 10 years ago for the Thunder Drummers program in Mrs. Flynn. This is the happy season of announcing scholarship winners. And there is no shortage of them here in Oxford. Among others, the high school's robotics team Torque brought home a total of $58,000 split among three kids. Laura Schimmel and Titus Shoemaker won $22,500 each in first scholarships. And Tyler Usewalk got that plus another $7,500 from Kettering University. Shoemaker also won an SME scholarship first Clark scholarship of $5,000 and the Phil Clancy Memorial First Scholarship of $1,000. Way to go, guys. One thing that impresses me when I walk through our schools is that it's not all about academics. Math teacher Joe Amabile heads a group called I'm Third. He tells us more. The organization's name is the I'm Third uh, Student Volunteer Group. Uh, the whole idea of um, the I'm Third name is uh, we encourage students to, whatever they believe about life, they put first in their life. Uh, second, you put other people, and then you put yourself third. And uh, the group kind of encompasses a whole different, a bunch of different uh, walks of life at the high school, you know, different people from different social groups. Uh, we encourage people that are involved in a lot after school to get involved with this. Um, but we just all come together with uh, the main goal being uh, a volunteer. And this exposes them to some pretty interesting things. Yeah, uh, we do some work at the uh, Baldwin Center down in Pontiac, uh, Gleaners Food Bank down in Pontiac. Um, we've done two extreme home makeovers, uh, one in the fall, one in the spring of this year. It's growing every year. Uh, we've done some work with uh, at the Senior uh, Hope Senior Center over there uh, with um, Oxford Fish, Oxford and Fish, uh, some canned food drives. Basically, whoever needs help with volunteering, they let me know and I spread the word out. And uh, it wouldn't function if the uh, students didn't want to volunteer, but there's, there's many who do all the time. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty successful. As we were walking through Todd Dunkley's high school, we noticed a couple of suspicious looking groups lingering in the hall. So we stopped to check it out. We're writing a script for Chinese um, on a bargaining. Uh, we're doing a shopping mall in Chinese. And then after we do that, we're going to work on our role play scene where I'm going to be bargaining and I'm going to have a friend who's trying to bargain with this man right here. A salesperson. Now you, you see you're, you're working on a shopping mall in Chinese. You mean in the Chinese language? Yeah. Yes. How many years have you had of Chinese so far? Um, well, we've had it since third grade, so six years. A Chinese shopping center? Todd, I think you better check these guys out. Perhaps a detention is in order. Don't forget Schooling Around premiering this week at 11 in the morning and 10 in the afternoon on weekdays. Dave Kenny is next with Science in the News and Wildcat Sports follows that. I'm John Ochens and this is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. Okay, well remember last week when you hit Vinny in the head with the shovel? <laughs> I do not recall that. Of course not. Well, it was too graphic for the kids, <laughs> so I'm going to have to block you. So, you know, i got to make this that's up. Really not this is Vinny's watch. Chill raw and prepared foods promptly. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the village of Leonard. Now with the school year coming to an end and with it high school sports, the Oxford Boys Varsity golf team decided to end on a high note. At the MHSAA District Tournament at Bald Mountain Golf Club in Lake Orion, the Cats tied with Rochester with an overall 302 team score at the end of regulation play and had to go into a fifth man tiebreaker for Ox Oxford to ultimately walk away with the district championship. J.J. Lewis shot a 79, Doug Schultz a 73, Matt Prince shot a 74, Raleigh Giberson a 76, and Eric Curtis 
rounded it out shooting an impressive 82. Big congratulations guys from all of us here at OCTV. Now the Senior Athletic Awards were handed out last week at the OHS Performing Arts Center. 131 senior letter winners from the 2014 graduating, uh, graduating class were given out, including awards for the MHSAA Scholar Athletes, who were Joe Horford, Zeb Throne, Tyler Scott, Lewis Marshall, Emily Cleland, Ava PC, and Sam Medici. Also given out was the Helen Smith Female Athlete of the Year Award to Darren Bendel, and the George Prince Male Athlete of the Year Award to Ben Line and Wesley Masco. Congratulations to all graduating seniors, and if you missed this ceremony but want to talk like you didn't, a list of all other award winners is posted on the school's athletic website, OxfordAthletics.org. Now in local pro sports news, the new Pistons head coach and GM Stan Van Gundy's uphill battle of turning around the troubled franchise got a little bit more difficult after they lost their first round pick in next month's NBA draft at the draft lottery last week to the reintroduced new look vintage Charlotte Hornets 2.0. Now the way the draft lottery works is each of the NBA teams not in the playoffs is entered into a lottery to determine the order they will select players in the NBA draft on June 26. The worst, teams with the, the worst teams with the worst regular season records get a better chance of making the lottery pick in the top three. Then after the top three teams are selected, the rest of the 11 remaining teams fall into slots based on record in reverse order. <laughs> so if you're still with me, the Pistons in 2012, in an effort to save some money, traded away Ben Gordon and his hefty contract to Charlotte for Corey, for, they traded to Charlotte for Corey Maggette and a future first round draft pick with the stipulation that if Detroit fell within the first eight selections, they got to keep their pick. So of course that's exactly what didn't happen, and the first three picks went to Cleveland, Milwaukee, and Philadelphia, causing the Stones to fall to the ninth spot, thus forfeiting their first round pick. Now they have to wait and hopefully select an impact college player with the 38th overall pick, or to simplify it even further, the Pistons' bad luck continues. I'm Andy Curtis, and remember you can catch all our broadcasts of your favorite Oxford High School and now Park and Rec League games weekends between 1 and 6 right here on OCTV, or check us out online under the program section of OCCTV.org. And this is your community station, so if you have a sports idea or the NBA draft lottery still does not make sense to you, shoot us an email at andrewcurtis23 at gmail.com and put OCTV Sports in the title. That was all the sports news you need to know. Thanks for watching and have a great day. for a Friday night fish at the Oxford American Legion Hall. It's delicious. We love the Legion. They have great fish and good family fun. American Legion fish fry. It's awesome. And the drinks are good. The food is good. The service is awesome. Hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, I, I followed your character since the first episode. I'm a, I'm a big fan, big, big fan. Thank you. Yeah, listen, your storyline, it makes for incredible TV drama. Thing is, your drug use is very adult content. Too adult for the kids. So I'm gonna have to block you. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, have a good one. You're a nice lady. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. After months in limbo, NASA's top exoplanet hunter will live again. The Kepler Space Telescope had suffered damage to its onboard steering system, so an updated plan was needed. Two weeks ago, NASA approved the K2 mission to keep Kepler in action for another two years. Good luck with that one. And still in space, this year's hottest outer space destination just got hotter. This, pic this picture, taken by the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft on May 4th, showed the comet 67P Chiramyumov-Gerashimenko 
emitting a halo of dust and gas as it approaches the sun. If all goes to plan, Rosetta will make history later this year when it orbits and then lands on the comet's surface to first for space exploration. Comets get their halo or coma from the sun as the sun heats up frozen gases that erupt from the surface and scatter dust everywhere. These particles remain in orbit around the central part of the comet, the nucleus, and make it appear much larger. The coma in this picture extends 808 miles into space. Rosetta launched in 2004 and was woken up in January this year after a three-year slumber. Now ESA is activating its instruments and putting the probe through its paces in preparation for the final approach to the comet in August. The craft is still 1.24 million miles away from the comet, but the pictures it took of the comet waking up have helped researchers determine that its rotation period uh, makes a turn every 2.4, or that is to say 12.4 hours, about 20 minutes shorter than previously thought. And back on land, birds fly hundreds of kilometers every night when they migrate south for the winter. Now it seems all North American land birds use one of just three routes when they seek out the sun. Different bird species often converge on the most efficient routes, resulting in clustered routes called flyways, not that dissimilar from a human highway. The flyways of water birds are well established, but land birds migrate at night and less is known about the paths they follow. So Frank Lassort and his colleagues from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, map the flyways of 93 land birds from the 2-gram ruby-throated hummingbird to the 500-gram broad-winged hawk. All fly at night and roost and feed during the day. Using a database called eBird that stores reports from bird watchers, the team created maps showing spring and autumn migration routes. Three flyways emerged. An eastern route used by 45 species, a central one with 17, and a western one with 31. This is one of the most detailed analyses of flyways, says Samantha Franks in the British Trust for Ornithology in Thetford, UK. The three flyways seem to be a hangover from the Ice Age, which began 2.6 million years ago and periodically covered most of North America in ice. The glaciers extended into the center of the continent, continent says Lesort, isolating the eastern and western portions. Later, the central portion became the Great Plains. That makes sense, says John Faberg from the University of Missouri in Columbia. Given that the eastern half of the U.S. is forested, the west is mountainous, and the grasslands split these two things up, it's not surprising that eastern forest birds stay east and western forest birds stay west, and grassland birds went right up the middle. The birds take different routes in spring and autumn, especially in the eastern and western flyways. In spring, as they head north, they seem to ride the winds to speed up their journey, aligning their routes with a nighttime jet stream that flows from the Gulf of Mexico into the Great Plains. The route is longer, but they enjoy stronger tailwinds. Lasort says climate change will probably strengthen the jet stream. We expect the cost of migration to potentially change, becoming energetically less expensive in the spring and more in the autumn. Such shifts in wind strengthen, wind strength do matter, according to a second study. Over a nine-year period, strong westerly winds during spring migration made yellow warblers less likely to survive the year. And climate change has an effect on everyone. In our last story, it's a volcano, but not as we know it. This cerulean eruption takes place in the Danakel Depression, a low-lying plain in Ethiopia. The volcano's lava is the usual orange-red. The blue comes from flames produced when escaping sulfuric gases burn. French photographer Olivier Grunewald creates such images without using color filters or digital enhancement, which is no simple task. To get this shot, he had to wait until dusk when the electric blue flames were visible, but before all the daylight had ebbed away. Then the wind had to be blowing away from him so he could get close enough. Photographing the similarly sulfurous Kawaijin volcano in Indonesia, where he worked inside the crater, was even more treacherous. We have to take care when the winds push the flames close to us, he says. In Danakil, it is easier to escape as the land is flat. Grunwald works in a gas mask to avoid breathing the deadly fumes. But in photographing Kawaijin, still left him with peeling skin and clothes smelling of rotten eggs for weeks afterwards, and I thought my job was tough. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you.
You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the village of Leonard.